Welcome back to this course on rendering, where today we will be talking about the path tracing algorithm, implementations, problems, pitfalls, and possible extensions of the basic approach. First up, please note that this lecture will feature a ton of mathematical notation, formulations, and pseudocode. These things are particularly easy to get wrong when you transfer them onto slides, so please forgive us if one of them crept in. If you think or know that there is an error in there, please don't hesitate to contact us. Your feedback helps us to improve this lecture. For the recorded version, we will also keep in the video description an narrator, so please look there first if you find an issue. But onward to today's goal. After bearing with us through light physics, Monte Carlo integration and the rendering equation, it is now time to put these things together and get some physically based rendering going. Our goal for today will be to move from direct lighting, for which we already got a sneak peek in the previous lecture, to full-on path tracing. We will do this by putting the recursive formulation of the rendering equation into a renderer and implement it as a recursive function. We will also define a clear interface for the main program loop, which will work for any rendering method that relies on Monte Carlo integration. In order to get a high quality solution, we will also go over the most fundamental concepts and optimizations we need to make for our implementation to be fast and stable. Towards the end, we will also introduce a dedicated interface for the BSDF or BRDF, which we already mentioned a few times, so that we can cleanly separate any material related computations from our basic path tracing algorithm. Now, what does BSDF or BRDF stand for? The full name of the BSDF is the bidirectional scattering distribution function, and it's the part of the rendering equation highlighted here that so far we mostly ignored or replaced with something constant in examples. The job of the BSDF is to describe the transport of light by a material. Specifically, the result of the function as it is written right here is the amount of incoming radiance from a direction omega that is passed on to a different direction v at a surface point x. In our case, for the rendering function, v will represent the ray that we followed to get to a hit point x, and omega is the next direction we look at. In the case of direct lighting, which we saw before, v would be the view ray, x the point the view ray hits, and omega would be the direction we follow to find a light source or not. The BRDF is a subset of the BSDF, which stands for Bidirectional Reflection Distribution Function. As the name suggests, a BRDF will only consider reflections, but not translucency or transparency of objects, which makes it more straightforward and less mathematically involved. In our basic version of the path tracer, we will implement it so that it is capable of handling opaque, perfectly diffuse materials only, and later extend it with more complex alternatives. What does that mean exactly? We generally distinguish three different types of materials. Note that this is not yet entirely physical, but rather a widely accepted convention to categorize materials by their appearance. Those that more or less evenly scatter incoming light in all possible directions are referred to as diffuse. A perfectly diffuse BRDF is uniform for all possible pairs of incoming and outgoing directions. Materials that reflect light only in a very small range of directions, that is, they mostly mirror light, are referred to as specular. A perfect mirror reflects any incoming light only in the mirror direction. The last group are glossy materials. They have qualities of both diffuse and specular materials, that is, a certain amount of light is scattered in all directions, but highlights can be seen from directions where incident light is mirrored. Note that for specular and glossy materials, the shape of the BRDF actually depends on the vector v, that is, 
for our purposes, the direction from which a view ray arrived at its current hit point. For the diffuse BRDF, the directions don't matter, as long as they are in the same hemisphere around the surface normal. And diffuse is what we will be focusing on in our implementation today. Here we have three examples of renderings of a bust with those three BRDFs being used in a path tracer. One with a perfectly diffuse BRDF, one with a perfectly specular BRDF, and one with a glossy BRDF. We can easily see the differences and their light distribution properties. Diffuse materials almost have a certain basic ambient brightness because most surfaces reflect some light in all directions, but they completely lack highlights. On the other hand, specular BRDFs only mirror incoming light and don't show any scattering at all. The glossy BRDF actually shows a mixture of both of these effects, which makes it look like plastic or clay. But as we said, today we will only make sure that our path tracer is capable of rendering scenes like the one on the very left. If you intend to recreate the steps we will be talking about today in code, there are a few basic requirements before you can do that. If you are following this course while using the Nori framework, you already have everything that you need to get started. If you are setting your solution up on your own, you will need a few features before you can start with the upcoming steps. You will need a way to load and query your scene and some geometry with a non-zero surface area in your scene should be marked as a light source. You will also need support for writing the results to a viewport, so basically some sort of image storage and a viewer. You will need a pinhole camera model that is placed somewhere in your scene and the ability to produce rays from the camera through the pixels of your viewplane. To follow rays through the scene, you will need a way to detect the closest intersections of geometry with your rays. And you can do this for now by iterating over all primitives in your scene and testing them, for instance, with the muller trambor algorithm. Lastly, you will need to get some additional information when you hit a closest surface point, such as the normal of the hit surface, its material and the underlying object. Okay then, let's see what we have ahead of us. This is today's roadmap of the topics we will be covering. After a quick recap, we will see how the rendering equation can give us accurate direct lighting and how we can implement it so that we can easily extend it to full path tracing later. We will get to a first solution by using what we learned about Monte Carlo integrals but we will soon see that we have to pay attention to sample distribution as well. To make our renderings physically correct, we will look at something called Russian Roulette for path tracing, followed by the introduction of a dedicated BSDF interface in our design. Eventually, we will arrive at version 1.0 of a path tracer, which will serve as the basis for the topics of the upcoming lectures. Let's start at the beginning and do a short recap of the rendering equation as we saw it last time. The rendering equation, which we have now seen quite a few times, gives us the light that we can observe coming towards us, the viewer, from a certain surface point X and is governed by the light that the surface emits plus the incoming light that it reflects from other directions. We already know that one way to solve the tricky part of this equation, the reflected incoming light, is to evaluate the rendering equation recursively, because there is an equality between the light that is received at point x1 from point x2 in one direction and the light that is reflected at point x2 in the opposite direction. This is what we derived last time. This means that if we want to evaluate the received light from direction omega 1 at point x1, we need only evaluate the reflectance function at point x2 in the opposite direction omega 2. 
we can actually take this solution to the rendering equation directly as is and use Monte Carlo integration as a tool to arrive at a solution for computing direct lighting that is easy to implement in code. We already saw a solution for doing direct lighting previously, but we will go through it using basic hemisphere sampling one more time, step by step, and see how it relates to the recursive formulation of the rendering equation. Let's begin with the common setup. We have one camera or eye point in the scene, and the first rays we follow are shot from that point through the centers of pixels on our view plane. Let's just focus on a single pixel for now. The concepts apply for all of them equally. Once a ray hits a point in the scene, we can then start to sample the hemisphere and see if we find some light. Note that our rays, for now, will never enter objects. If we find the hit point, we will check where the next rays or bounces can be shot to. Let's now focus on one particular ray that bounced and actually found a light source and see how we can resolve what we should do now with the rendering equation. To make things easier for us, we will simplify our notation a bit. We can do this because we are only considering diffuse materials today. EX will be used as a stand-in for light emitted by a point X, and similarly, we can replace the term for the BRDF with a constant term 1 over pi to simulate a diffuse white material. We should already be able to access most of the relevant factors in the equation. If we have information about our hit point x, we can find whether it emits any light, the term 1 over pi is a constant, and if we know the surface normal at x and the bounce direction omega, we can use some basic trigonometry to find the cosine of theta. So far so good, but what we don't know is the recursive part. So let's try to expand this and see what we find in there. In the expanded version, not much has changed. There is an additional factor for the emitted light at point Y and another recursive integral for all future bounces. But if all we want to compute is direct lighting, we actually don't need the information from additional bounces because any light they could contribute would be indirect lighting. So we can set this term to zero and simplify our solution. Now the only new term, the emitted light of point Y, is something that hopefully our framework can give to us. In practice, this should just be a parameter for the light intensity and color, which you can define for any objects in your scene yourself that you want to act as a light source. We are also keeping the emitted light at point X in there because who knows, Maybe that is a light source as well, and we should respect its emitted light. The last thing that is stopping us from putting this into code is this pesky integral. And it's not a trivial integral either. It's defined over a non-standard domain, the surface of a hemisphere. But lucky for us, we already know a way to replace arbitrary integrals with something more manageable. That is Monte Carlo integration. This changes the integral into a sum, where we combine the results of randomly sampled directions to approximate the integral over the entire hemisphere. And hopefully you can see that the more samples we take, the more thoroughly we will be covering the hemisphere around X with more and more samples or bounced off rays, and the better our results will become. Note that if we shoot our rays through the pixel center, they will always hit the same point in the scene and we get a nice sampling of our hemisphere around point X. And here we see how the integral maps to our multiple rays that we shot into the scene that may or may not end up finding light. The more rays we send in, the better the image quality becomes. There is one more thing we need to talk about that is more complicated than it may seem now and it's related to this new term that popped up with the Monte Carlo integration, the one over the probability density of omega in the back 
You see, for Monte Carlo integration to work correctly, every sample that we draw from the domain must be weighted by the inverse probability density of picking it. If those two don't match, then we get wrong approximations, and getting it right can actually be quite tricky. But this is a topic for another day. For now, we will give you a fast path to path tracing by giving you the methods for creating uniform samples on the hemisphere and the probability to go along with it. You can easily do this by drawing two uniformly random values in the range from 0 to 1 and following the steps given below. We will derive them in an upcoming lecture, but we want you to be able to use them without going through all the mathematical steps if you don't care for them. Since the distribution is uniform, every sample that you generate this way has the same probability density for choosing it. So you can just set the PDF of omega to 1 over 2 pi constant term. The samples for omega that we produced with the steps on the last slide will be uniform in the hemisphere, but that hemisphere will be in local space. The sample would still work if the surface you hit is exactly aligned with your scene's coordinate system, but that is rarely the case. So before you can keep tracing, you must bring that sample omega from local to world space. This is usually done with the inverse of an orientation matrix. You can find a link with the steps for building one on the last slide, or if you use Nori, you can use the two local and two world methods to convert between the two coordinate systems. For now, two world will be enough. Later on, you will also want to bring world space rays into the local coordinate frame. We'll get there. Let's now try our hand at implementing the solution for direct lighting. We can do a straightforward transfer of the expanded rendering equation into code. We first do some basic setup for our first hit point in the scene, where we trace the ray through the pixel, find the closest hit, and gather some information about it. We use V inverse for the ray that triggers the hit, because we usually use V to denote a ray that is pointing away from a hit point. The mean for approximating the hemisphere integral is computed by a for loop with a division at the end. The part inside the loop corresponds to the factors inside the sum. The most complex thing in there is the generation of a uniform sample. We trace a ray in this new sample direction, get a required info about the hit point, and combine material, emittance, cosine, and weighting factors together. Let's see what all of this effort gives us. Great, it works. Not entirely unexpected, and the result is also not too exciting either, but the takeaway message here is that we arrived at this point by using only the rendering equation and applying Monte Carlo integration. We can make a slight modification, which will make things easier for us in the long run. We can pull the sum to the front. Try to confirm for yourself that this is the same as before, given that we always shoot our rays through the center of the pixel. This leaves us with one big loop that encloses all the light transport logic. Now we can encapsulate all of that light transport logic into a dedicated function, which we will call li. This means that the main loop can be a simple loop with a mean computation, and we can use different versions of the li function to compute different things. All it needs as a parameter is the ray to follow and find a hit point, v inverse. This works as long as we make sure that the things we compute in our li functions are valid and appropriately weighted Monte Carlo samples of a given integrand. Remember the basic Monte Carlo integration, which consists of a division, a sum, and summed values fx over the PDF of x. As long as we can make sure that our LE functions return values of the form fx over PDF of x, 
We can integrate whatever we want and use any sampling strategy we want as well. For this reason, if you are using Nori or any other modular rendering framework, you can have one basic sampling loop and pack the actual rendering work into different integrators with a function LE that you can call from the main loop. One last thing that we need to mention is the issue of infinite rays. In the real world, your rays would sooner or later hit some kind of medium and get scattered around. In a digital scene, your environment might just end because you don't provide geometry beyond a certain extent. In this case, there can be no follow-up bounds and therefore also no light can ever come back from this ray. In that case, you should just return zero or black whenever that happens. Now it's time to get serious. Because this just worked so well, let's try and see if we can just keep doing what we did before, but this time we will keep bouncing to collect more and more light by recursively following the rendering equation. If we can do this, then we have achieved what we set out to do, path tracing. We already passed our first milestone of this lecture, so now we will focus on our next big goal, a working path tracing prototype. Beyond just the direct illumination, we now also want to collect all the remaining less obvious light that we may find when we examine our scene closely. A quick modification for now, though, is that we want to expand our abilities to produce interesting images. The first step in this direction will be to add color. Before, we used the constant 1 over pi, which corresponds to a perfectly white material. We will still stick to diffuse materials, so the value that we use for the BRDF will still be a constant term per object. However, if our scene supports it, we can define an albedo for each material of the objects in our scene and read it back when we find a hit point. If a diffuse material has a certain albedo or base color rho, then we can use this rho and return it divided by pi as the new material term. Rho should be a three-valued vector with red, green and blue channels separately. This will give you the chance to have darker, brighter and differently colored objects and mix them in your scene for some interesting results. When we talk about rendering and generating realistic images, things start to get interesting once we go beyond direct lighting and start to consider light that arrives at surfaces after multiple bounces. The indirect illumination. And the principle is the same as before. All the key ingredients are already there, we just need to repeat them multiple times. Indirect illumination makes a ton of difference. On the left hand side, we see a rendering with 500 samples and direct lighting only. On the right hand side, we have added light from up to three additional bounces. Notice that the scene is brighter. We can see clear examples of color bleeding, like the red on the side of the tall cube, and it looks much less artificial than the image on the left. In real-time graphics and renderers, based on rasterization, developers struggle to achieve these effects. With path tracing routines, they come almost naturally. You will see that the change that we have to make to a direct light renderer in order to get these effects is not that big. Let's see how we can get there. Again, we are only looking at one path that happens to hit a light source and the setup is the same as before. We have the same settings with a few notational differences. Because we now support colors in our scene, we switch up the notation slightly. We use FR to represent a hit object's constant material term. Also, we now don't use points X and Y, but rather X and X prime for now. There will be several more hit points as we keep bouncing, so we will just be adding strokes as we go along the path from point to point. 
We now change our scene a bit so that the light that we find in our path turns from direct to indirect light. Okay, clearly this scene would have some light that is reflected off x prime onto x and from there to the viewer. We still have the initial rendering equation at the bottom. Let's expand it one more time, but this time we have to keep all the terms in it because we want to keep the ability to keep on bouncing. Here we have expanded the central part of the integral once, and this time we write the full expansion because we need all of it. You should stop here for a moment and pay close attention to what it is we are seeing in here. Maybe you want to stop for a bit and see if you can find the repeating pattern in this equation. And sure enough, there is one. To the left and to the right of the function for incoming light, we have factors that keep accumulating as we keep following more and more bounces. Note that with every expansion, we are only adding terms that we can easily find if we have information about each hit point on our path. The emitted light, the material terms and the cosines of the angle. All that is information that we can easily get. Now, you heard last time that the rendering equation can be expressed recursively, but it's perhaps good to see it expanded here and confirm this pattern for yourself as well. Also, if you know this pattern, it also means that you don't necessarily need to use a recursion in your code if you don't want to, but we will be using it in our examples for the sake of compactness. In path tracing, a path can go on much longer than what we showed here. There can be an arbitrary number of bounces, but the method always stays the same. Trace rays, identify hit points, accumulate any emitted light, multiply it by the right material terms and cosine factors, and then keep bouncing. The recursive approach is straightforward to put into code, but before we do that, we should still replace the integrals by something more definitive. We do this again by approximating each integral on our route with Monte Carlo integration. As before, this adds the additional sample weights, another factor that we need to keep track of. A justified question is how many samples we should be using in each of the individual Monte Carlo sums. Through intuition, you might just want to go ahead and use the same fixed number of samples for each sum. That way, every hemisphere that we try to approximate on our path will be equally well covered, which seems fair. All right, this seems like it's a decent extension of what we had before. And this time, all we did was take the full rendering equation without omitting any terms from it. Notice how we now have multiple sums and therefore multiple continuing rays emanating from every hit point along our path. Keep in mind that each of these rays themselves will probably hit something and at that hit point it will itself spawn more rays to sample a hemisphere, each of which will then spawn more rays and so on and so on. But for now, let's not worry too much. This should give us the solution to the full light transport as observed from the viewpoint and thus super realistic lighting in our scene. Let's again try to put our current solution into code. Here we have the rendering equation and we solve the internal parts of it using recursion. Most of the setup and code structure should look familiar to you already. You can see how we add the emitted light in each bounce here, how we take care of computing the mean here and here, how we now consider an object's material term for the diffuse BRDF here, how we compute the cosine of theta omega as before, and how we divide by the probability density of omega. Lastly, you can see the recursive call to Li here. 
We are kind of breaking the final design that we arrived at before with direct lighting because there no longer is one single main loop that can do the sum and mean for us. But we kind of have to break it because we now have many sums due to the many nested integrals of the rendering equation. Now there's also the question of how many samples we should be choosing for each of the nested sums. This is interesting because we didn't discuss so far what to pick there. Before when we had a single sum, theoretically we could just keep going until we are happy with the quality of our rendering. But now because of the nested sums we would need to know that before we even start rendering. So we will at first try to stick to something low and then gradually move up and see how things develop. All right, we run this again on our Cornell box scene. And what do we get? Well, not much. Many of you probably already expected this, but of course this happens if we just follow the rendering equation to a T. You see, the Cornell box is a closed scene. The rendering equation is an infinite dimensional integral. There is no built-in stopping criterion. So in a closed scene, rays just keep on bouncing forever. This program never ever terminates. I don't know about you, but a render time of infinity seconds per frame doesn't sound too good to me. We need a stopping criterion. And perhaps we can just get away with a low number of bounces for now, like three. That's already quite a bit of indirect bouncing going on. So we will just add a recursion depth parameter to our function and stop as soon as we exceed a given maximum number of bounces, in this case three, and let's run it one more time. All right, we already can recognize our scene. And if you look very closely, we can even see color bleeding that we wouldn't have gotten before with just direct lighting. This looks very promising, but the quality is really not great. Let's crank it up because this rendering only took three seconds to create and we have some time to spare. So we can increase the number of samples that we use in each Monte Carlo integral of the rendering equation. This is already clearly better. The render time went up a bit, but it is not too bad yet. So we can keep going. And this looks better still, but the render time is slowly getting a bit problematic. With another doubling of the number of samples, the quality improved yet a little more, but the increase in render time was dramatic. I trust that most of you in this day and age will recognize a nonlinear growth when they see it. It's time for our first great insight of the day. The more samples you use for path tracing with a given algorithm, the closer your images will get to the truth. But their creation will also take longer. This brings us to the topic of distributing samples and only using them for the things we really need. Let's quickly revisit what we did just now. We started with a direct implementation of the rendering equation, replacing each integral on our path with Monte Carlo. When we ran into infinite runtimes, we limited the amount of bounces to just three, which actually really isn't all that much. But it's also clear that with each additional bounce, the number of rays to trace grows exponentially, meaning that with this solution, we won't be able to take it much further. This is bad news for indirect illumination and the complex lighting phenomena that we are looking for. Even with only three bounces, once we started increasing our samples to improve quality, the render time eventually got out of hand. Does this mean that path tracing is doomed? No, not at all. There's a ton of things that we can still do to make path tracing faster and smarter. Actually, this is just where the relevant and important work for all modern renderers begins. Let's first look back at our approach for expressing the rendering equation in code. 
Before, we turned every integral on our path through the scene into its own sum. However, if we rewrite the rendering equation, we can see more clearly where our precious processing power is going to this way. All we did here was multiply out the contents of each bracket. Remember that every integral here will be a sum in our implementation. The more consecutive integrals, the more samples will be used to calculate the parts that follow it. With every additional line, the number of nested integrals grows, and thus the more expensive its computation becomes in our current implementation. If you now look at this new arrangement, can you guess what each of these lines does? Every one of them contains exactly one emittance term, which is interesting. Here's a hint. You already saw this last time, but we used a different notation back then. Got it? We will start showing the solution on the next slide. Let's look at it line by line. On the right, you see the results that you get if you only use the computations in line one. Actually, what we see is only the light source in our scene itself. That is, light that we can find immediately at the first intersection with the scene. If we visualize the output of the second line, it is clearly light that we found not at the first, but the second intersection with our scene. That is, only light that comes from the first bounce. Notice how we can no longer see the light source. This is exactly all the light that is directly reflected towards the viewer via a single bounce off of a surface. By now you may see where this is going. The next line represents only the light that reaches the viewer via exactly two bounces, that is, the simplest form of indirect light. Notice the color bleeding on the side of the tall cube again. The fourth line here gives us light that reaches the viewer via exactly three bounces. Note how the image seems to get darker the more bounces we add. This is because as light bounces around, it is attenuated by the material terms of the objects it hits, which is what enables us to see color, but also by the cosine terms when it hits a surface at an angle. So this means that if we combine this with our implementation and do the math, we can easily work out how many samples we are spending on the individual contributions to our image. For a given base setting of n samples, we are using one sample for light sources themselves, n samples for direct lighting, n squared for two bounds in direct light, and so on and so on. Therefore, we spend more and more samples on increasingly indirect light in our scene. This is not necessarily a bad thing, but as you can see here, usually the earlier bounces have a more noticeable effect on the full image and therefore contribute more to the perceived quality. So if anything, we would actually like to give each of these parts roughly the same number of rays and processing power. How can we do that when we have these multiple nested integrals? Well, actually, it's only a question of definition. Remember how this combination of different bounces was presented to you last time? Back then, we used the so-called path integral form of the rendering equation. And the path integral expresses exactly the same thing we are trying to compute here, just the notation is different. It actually only uses a single integral per bounce light. This is because it simply defines its integration domain differently. And we can do the same thing. We can integrate over a single domain that is defined by all possible hemispheres in our paths. For example, the light received from the first bounce is the integral over a single hemisphere at the first hit point in our scene. The light received by the second bounce is the integral 
over all hemispheres that can be reached when we sample the hemisphere around the first hit point. The third bounce light is the integral over all the hemispheres that can be reached by all the hemispheres that can be reached by the hemisphere around the first hit point. I hope you get the idea. The thing is, we can just define these nested integrals as one integral over a higher dimensional, more complex domain, which is exactly what the path integral did. All we need to get from one to the other is a change of the integration variable. When we sample the surface of the hemisphere, we usually have two degrees of freedom, which is why we need two random numbers whenever we do it. With every new bounce, we are increasing the dimensionality of the integral by two. So the integral over all hemispheres that can be reached by the hemisphere around the primary hit point can be seen as a four-dimensional integral, then a six-dimensional integral for the next line, then eight, and so on and so on. The good thing is that Monte Carlo is great at handling higher dimensional integrals. That's why we chose it in the first place. So if all of these nested integrals can be written as one, and integrals of arbitrary dimension can be replaced by Monte Carlo integration, then what we end up with is something like this, with several cumulative sums. This already seems like a step in the right direction, because if we were to implement this, obviously we would be using the same number of rays for the light that we receive from each individual bounce. Over the first few hits, for the same parameter n, we are now sending out way fewer samples in total, although we still use the exact same amount to compute the quality of direct lighting. There is also no more exponential growth with each additional hit, meaning that we also probably could easily go beyond three or more bounces this way. But before we do this, we can still simplify our solution a bit more. So let's try that. Specifically, it looks like we can pull all those sums to the front. And if we do that and put everything else inside brackets, we end up with only a single sum in the front. This is reminiscent of what we had when we rearranged our solution for direct lighting, where we were also left with a single sum in the front. Finally, we can undo our conversion from the recursive notation to the sum of sums to get back to the recursive formulation again. In this final form, we can again clearly see the recursive nature of the rendering equation, but now with only a single sum in the front. This is actually perfect for us. Not only do we now have a more balanced distribution of samples to the contribution from different bounces in the scene, but we also have that single sum in the front, which means we can actually use it with the basic main loop that we designed so we can abstract away the path tracing integrator. Let's now try to make the changes to implement this new behavior and let's do it with the proper integrator interface. Here we go. This is what an implementation could look like. As before, we now have a simple main loop that can call arbitrary integrator functions and takes care of computing the mean for the Monte Carlo integral. We made a slight modification to our interface here and gave the li function a recursion counter. If you don't want to do this, you could also just make the path tracing integrator li function a stub that always immediately calls a recursive version with an additional parameter zero instead. But let's quickly check if actually all the other things we need are here. We have the emission term being added, the material factor computed like we did before, the recursive call to the next bounce, as well as the cosine term and the probability weight of the sample we selected. Let's see what we can expect from a solution like this. On my laptop, these images were created with the two versions we discussed now, 
both of them took approximately three minutes to generate. The result on the left was generated with the number of samples per sum set to 16, the one on the right with n set to 2048. While the image on the right certainly is not perfect, it does a much better job at balancing samples across the features that we care about. Can you see how smooth the ceiling in the left image is compared to the rest? This is because it mostly receives indirect light. It is actually smoother than the one on the right, but if you're honest, I assume you didn't even notice up until now. So the image on the right is clearly the way to go. And we are mostly going to stick with this way of distributing our samples, but we are going to tweak it. Which brings us to our next wisdom of the day. Your path tracing samples are precious. You should put them where they matter most to make sure you get a good return on investment. Now that we have our new and improved path tracer with a fixed number of supported bounces, we should revisit the question of how indirect illumination should be or how many bounces we should put in for a good stopping criterion. Before, we have seen one to three bounces and the difference that it makes. The question is, however, how many bounces are enough? Remember that for an unbiased, physically based rendering method, every possible path that has a probability that is non-zero has to be taken into account by the renderer with some non-zero probability. A light path only has a 0% chance of continuing when all the photons have been absorbed. But no material on Earth actually absorbs 100% of all light. So that means no matter how many bounces, the probability of a light ray continuing on never goes to zero. That means for a fully unbiased path tracer, you cannot just put a hard limit on the number of bounces. But how can we possibly account for infinitely long light paths? The answer to this is given by our next stop on today's route. Russian Roulette Path Termination. Let us look once more at the sample distribution with respect to the light that we receive from different numbers of bounces and the contribution they make towards our final image. It is important to remember that most of the light that we as observers notice comes from the first few bounces. In some cases, especially when we have specular materials, however, light that is reflected over seven or more bounces can still make a significant difference, but those cases are rather rare. So if we want to account for longer paths, but not spend an infinite amount of computation power on them, could we maybe do the exact opposite of what we had before? That is, implement something that makes paths increasingly rare the longer they continue, but not impossible. Ideally, the new sample distribution could look something like this. We go over the first few bounces as before, but after that, fewer and fewer samples are spent to continue onward until practically none of them are left. Surprisingly, we can do something like this quite easily, and what's more, we can even use it to create an unbiased approximation of an image in which every ray continues infinitely. The technique that makes all of this possible is called Russian Roulette. Russian roulette in path tracing works as follows. You first decide on the probability PRR for continuing array. Then, at each hit point, you draw a random variable. If the value you drew is below a fixed continuation probability, the ray gets to continue for another bounce. Otherwise, the ray is terminated, hence the name of the technique. Thus, the longer it goes on, the higher the chances of a path ending. But a path could still theoretically go on forever, so the method is unbiased and limited only by the floating point resolution of your machine. The longer a path gets, 
the higher we make the contribution of its final color value. In theory, we want paths to be as long as possible, but since we cannot compute this, we make sure that the impact of the long paths, which happen rarely, is compensated by weighting them with the reciprocal of their probability. To make this idea easy to internalize, we illustrate it here in a simplistic sample scene. Here, both objects, the blue box and the pink sphere, are emitting light into the scene. Assume that we now perform path tracing with Russian roulette and we use a very aggressive termination policy, where each ray only has a 20% chance to continue for another bounce. In this case, when we shoot rays through a given pixel into our scene, 80% of the paths we follow never even visit the pink sphere. So in four out of five samples, we stop immediately and as an observer, we only see blue color. But after approximately five attempts, give or take, one of the rays is actually allowed to continue. Now this ray hits the pink sphere. Because it had a lower chance of survival, we actually weight it by multiplying with the reciprocal of its survival probability, or in other words, we multiply by 5. That way, we add the pink light we just found to our total 5 times, and by doing so, we make it as if all of the rays up until now were actually allowed to do 2 bounces instead of 1. This compensation is a powerful new mechanic. In this very simple scene, it's a very accurate compensation too, because the pink sphere encloses everything. For more complex scenes, it is much less accurate, but it still allows us to make an unbiased approximation of what the result would be if every path was allowed to continue for many more bounces than it actually did. Let's take it one step further. We now go through the previous routine multiple times. Approximately every five samples, we have one that survives the first bounce. But once in approximately 25 such attempts, one of them will actually manage to survive the second bounce as well. And because light from the second bounce is so rare in this scenario, we actually weight it by multiplying it by 25 to compensate for the 24 paths where we did not continue past the second bounce. In this case here, our surviving sample actually hits the blue box again. Note that this will result in a rather poor approximation of the total light from the second bounce, because the blue box only represents a small fraction of the entire scene. However, it is the only information that we have so far for the second bounce, so we will use it and extrapolate it to all other paths where we didn't collect any information at all. Note also how the blue light from the last bounce is much darker than the first one. Remember that this is because of the material and cosine factors that attenuate the transported light with each new bounce. Of course, as we keep using more and more samples, our approximation of indirect light will eventually get better and better. And that is the whole idea behind Russian Roulette. Now, if you first try to implement this concept yourself, you might be tempted to use the recursion depth as the exponent for the survival probability as the compensation term. But you shouldn't do this because if we use the recursive implementation, the potentiation of the weight happens all by itself if you just use 1 over PRR to multiply with the return value of each recursion. If this makes your head spin a bit, maybe take a closer look at the code on the next slide and stop there to try and work it out why that is so. There's actually very little we have to change in order to get Russian Roulette going. We can now remove the fixed stopping criterion from the top of our LI function. Then, after we have the emittance of a hit point accounted for, we take the Russian Roulette survival probability, which should be between 0 and 1, and we draw a random uniform variable 
also between 0 and 1. If the drawn random value is greater than the survival rate, we return only the emitted light from the current hit point and no more bounces are being pursued. We can put the compensation term right next to the PDF because it actually serves a very similar job. So now you may ask, is it safe to have a program that in theory could still be running forever? And the answer is yes, it's fine because it will almost certainly never happen. If you choose your probability PRR as a reasonable value, it is much more likely to get a universal unique ID collision than that ever happening. But in that case, you might think, okay, the smaller I choose PRR, the earlier the paths will terminate, the faster I get my output image, and it's still unbiased. So let's just pick a very small survival probability and be done with it. Well, that is true. It would still be unbiased, but there are other reasons why you don't want that. For instance, look at these two images. One computed with a survival probability of 0.7, the other with 0.1. Obviously, the one on the right completed much quicker, and at first glance, they might seem pretty even in terms of quality. But hold on, if we look closely, somehow we have artifacts that look like dead pixels. We have zoomed in here so that you can see them more easily. It seems like suddenly your monitor broke in very weird places, but that is not the case. This is part of your computed image now. The algorithm is correct and unbiased. We made sure of that and it's much quicker. So maybe we can fix these weird little things by adding more samples. And we have done this here and multiplied the number of samples by four for the image on the right. It now takes over three times as long as the one on the left. So we have already missed our goal, but even worse, it still has those weird little artifacts. So with a very low survival probability, we get those strange little artifacts and they won't even go away if we let our renderer run for a much longer time. This is due to something that we already mentioned before. Because the survival probability is low, the probability of multiple bounce paths that make a reasonable contribution also becomes low. But as we know from the Monte Carlo lecture, if the value of a sample function is high, but its probability is low, that means we are increasing variance and therefore noise. Or in other words, those rare samples, because they are so rare, get a very high contribution and show up as bright spots that are hard to get rid of, even with many additional samples. These artifacts, due to their strong local impact on the image color, are also colloquially referred to as fireflies. So now we know that the choice of the proper Russian roulette survival probability is important and should neither be too high nor too low. In fact, a good and commonly used idea is to pick the survival probability at each bounce separately so that we can reduce the occurrence of fireflies. This brings us to a very sensible policy for choosing survival probability depending on the remaining contribution of each sample, throughput. With throughput, we simply keep track of the total remaining contribution after all bounces so far and use it as a probability. That way, the probability of a path continuing for another bounce corresponds directly to the intensity that it can still deliver to a pixel. An additional benefit, paths with little chance of making any difference in the image are more likely to get terminated earlier. But consider, for instance, tracing a path over multiple very bright or mirroring surfaces that absorb very little light. For them, the throughput term would stay relatively high for a long time as it keeps bouncing around, enabling effects like caustics. To use this, we can use the formula given below. The term on the right defines the RGB throughput for each hit point, 
which is simply the product of all the material, cosine and probability terms of previously visited hit points on your path multiplied together. You should try to confirm for yourself that this is, in fact, a correct measure of the amount by which a ray can still affect the pixel it contributes to at any point along the path. To get a single probability, we can take the RGB color channel of the throughput with the highest value. Making this modification in code is not too hard either. We just need to add an extra parameter to our recursive function, which we initially set to an RGB vector with all ones. We can then choose the survival probability from the throughput before we decide whether the ray continues or stops. The terms we need for updating the throughput, the material terms, cosines and probability for omega and Russian roulette, are all things that we already have available. But since we now are using them twice in our code, it makes sense to store material terms and cosines now as explicit variables. Lastly, we only have to make sure that the next recursion receives the updated throughput. There are some things that you should do to your implementation in order to make Russian Roulette a bit more effective. First, it is often advisable to have a minimum bounce depth in our path tracer before Russian Roulette takes effect, so you get a basic level of fidelity for the light from direct and early indirect illumination. For instance, a good idea is to make sure that the first two to three bounces always happen before Russian Roulette kicks in to terminate the ray. You can easily do this without changing your code too much by forcing the survival probability of the first few bounces to one. Second, if we use throughput with Russian Roulette, we must note that some materials might have a high or perfect reflection which could diminish the influence of Russian Roulette and have many paths that keep going for a very long time. So we should make sure that the survival probability gradually decreases, for instance, by bounding each bounce's survival probability with 0.99. If you stick to these recommendations, you will get a textbook behavior for your Russian roulette technique, and you can expect a good quality in your renderings. Now, in production renderers and solutions, Sometimes you might find that instead of what we went for with Russian Roulette, you might actually see a little more extra attention on the first and second bounce. So actually, direct light and shadows might receive the most samples in order to make sure that they are very crisp and high quality. We will not go into detail in this course how you can achieve this, but if you are interested, it should now be not too hard to try and experiment with these modifications yourself by combining individual solutions that we already saw today. Now, before we move on to the next topic, a final word on what we just saw in the application of Russian Roulette. We picked a certain event with a given probability and then to compensate for our choice, we divided the influence of each sample by that probability. And we actually put that compensation term right next to the probability density of the hemisphere sampling direction omega. This is not a coincidence. Those two terms perform a very similar job inside our bigger Monte Carlo framework. Let's quickly revisit the influence of the PDF of omega on the rendering equation. We divide our contributions in every bounce by the probability density of omega for two reasons. One is because of proper scaling. The surface area of the hemisphere is 2 pi, and in uniform sampling, we divide by 1 over 2 pi, which means we multiply the incoming light by the hemisphere surface area. This is because when we pick one direction on the hemisphere, we use the result as a sample that we pretend represents the full hemisphere. This way, with uniform sampling and Monte Carlo integration, we get a decent approximation of the lighting on the whole hemisphere 
by collecting many poorly approximated hemisphere samples and averaging them together. The information what direction the light came from is actually never stored and gets lost. But at the end of the day, we only care about the average color and intensity of the reflected light by a point. The second reason is to compensate for a particular choice we make. It's not very significant now because we are only using uniform hemisphere sampling, so every choice is equally likely, but it will be much more important when we actually look at different ways of sampling a domain such as the hemisphere. With Russian Roulette, we do something very similar, but it is kind of special because here we don't compensate for choosing certain samples. We compensate for the fact that we sometimes just stop sampling completely. So it makes sense to put these two factors together as compensation terms. It is important to realize that with Monte Carlo, everything you do is basically a game of choosing samples and then compensating for your choice. Whenever you draw a random variable in Monte Carlo integration to make a decision, you should be wary that most likely you should be compensating for that choice somehow. For instance, take light source sampling, which we saw a few lectures back. With light source sampling, what do you do? You pick a single point on a light source, find if the light from that point can reach your shaded surface and then scale up that received light, pretending that you receive the same amount from every single point on the light source area without checking them all, because we know that would be impossible. But if you have multiple lights, you should actually check all of them because your shaded surface point could receive light from all of them. And we mustn't miss any of it in our calculations. If you perhaps don't want to send rays to all lights in your scene, you can pick one. Which one? That is up to you. But afterwards, you have to make sure that you compensate for your choice. You choose one instead of all of them. If you did it uniformly, you should compensate by multiplying the light that you got from it by the total number of light sources in your scene. We leave it as an exercise to the viewer to work this out on your own and recommend doing so to get a feeling for how and why this compensation business is necessary to get correct results. This brings us to our final wisdom of the day. Monte Carlo integration is all about picking samples and then compensating for it. The way you pick those samples is up to you. But if you cherish your samples, you will do it in a smart way, and we call this important sampling. You already heard a bit about important sampling before, but we will be seeing quite a bit more of it soon. It is now time to make a last modification to our code before we can call it a day and appreciate our basic path rendering framework. That modification is related to the BSDF and its abstract representation of lighting-related material factors. Remember that we said that our path tracer is only capable of handling purely diffuse materials. The diffuse material scatters any incoming light equally in all directions. This is by no means bad and already enough to make a few nice renderings and interesting scenes like the ones on the right but there are more exciting options available down the line. Other interesting objects like mirrors, glass, plastics, metal, and many more would require that we have support for materials other than just perfectly diffuse ones. And right now, our path tracer is built around the diffuse behavior. Ideally, we don't want to rewrite our rendering code whenever we add support for a new material, or add cascading switches or if-else clauses that make it unreadable. A much better idea is to see if and how we can isolate the material-related factors in our code and encapsulate them in a dedicated class. 
Let's first look at all the parts in our code that depend on the material being diffuse. There's a lot of them and we highlighted them here. We'll go through them one by one. The first one is related to the fact that so far we used uniform hemisphere sampling. But sometimes, for instance, in the case of a perfect mirror, which reflects incoming light from one direction in exactly one other direction, sampling the hemisphere doesn't make much sense. So we want to move the generation of sample directions out of our main loop. Also, we may want to not use uniform sampling and use different probability densities later. The different options we have for doing that should definitely be moved to the BSDF class. Next, we have the computation of the BRDF factor, that is, the amount of light that we reflect. We said before that for diffuse, and only for diffuse, this can be a fixed term depending only on an object's albedo. But we will see that depending on what materials are being used, the amount of reflected light is actually governed by several factors. So also what you want to make sure is that this is encapsulated as part of the material class. An interesting thing to single out here is the cosine of theta. We have mentioned multiple times where it comes from and why we need it. And it seems like something that would apply to any surface no matter the material. The truth, however, is that in more than one case, it's best to actually abandon this cosine term altogether to ensure conservation of energy or simply because it cancels out. Thus, if at all needed, we should also move it into the BSDF implementation. Finally, we have the probability density of the selected sample direction omega. There are some clear issues that can arise from this. For some mirror-like materials, the probability density of arbitrary directions is not even clearly defined or might be zero. And using undefined terms or zero as a divisor is always a recipe for chaos. So we should make sure to move this into the abstract class as well. All of these factors can be taken care of with a suitable BSDF interface, such as the one that is provided in the NORI framework. The interface we recommend defines three functions, eval, PDF, and sample. In NORI, these functions use an auxiliary parameter struct BREC that they can use to access and store a whole range of parameters. The most important ones are the outgoing direction V and incoming direction omega of light to compute the amount of transported light for a surface. The three functions have the following jobs. Eval should compute the material's amount of reflected light into direction V coming from direction omega. PDF should compute the probability density of ever choosing an arbitrary input direction omega. And sample has the job of generating and storing a new sample omega and compute its associated multipliers that we need to include in the rendering equation. For the diffuse BRDF, this is simple to complete. We already know its ability to reflect light, which is the same fixed material term that we used before, based on the albedo. Of course, light should only be reflected along directions that actually lie in the hemisphere around the normal. Otherwise, it would be a refraction. The PDF of each possible direction omega, if we use uniform hemisphere sampling, is again 1 over 2 pi for all omega that lie in the same hemisphere as the surface normal. Lastly, the sample method should create a valid random direction omega to continue a path from a given point, and it should also return a combined material-based multiplier that incorporates the amount of reflected light, the cosine term, and the sample probability density.
Actually, for now, this last function is all that we need in our code. If we look at how the new interface can be incorporated, it becomes evident that it makes for a much cleaner code. All we need is the sample function to generate a new sample direction omega at each bounce, along with the combined multiplier that we use to weight all the light from the following bounces. The only additional factor left in our code at this point is the Russian roulette compensation. And that's it. Now is a great time to pat yourself on the shoulder because you have now seen how to create a clean and powerful path tracing framework that is ready for future improvements and extensions. For those who are already interested in how you can modify your path tracing framework and extend it with new and exciting features, we can highlight some of them here. Because of its general design, it's very easy for us to add in a few additional dimensions to the integral and make it yet even higher dimensional. Let's quickly revisit the meaning of the dimensions for path tracing samples. We already know some of them. For instance, the random variables that go into the construction of a new ray after each bounce, the continuation probability for Russian roulette. But there are other interesting effects that we can consider. And if we want to support them in our path tracing, all we have to do is add them as additional dimensions to our integrated samples. Some popular examples of this multidimensional path tracing include depth of field or motion blur effects. We will quickly look at how something like this could be achieved. Depth of field is a popular effect in visual computing mainly for simulating the way that light is captured by real-world camera lenses. Camera lenses and cameras are influenced by several parameters like the aperture, focal length and several others. Modifying these settings on a camera changes how much of a scene it can actually capture with high fidelity, that is, make it sharp on the resulting image. Sharpness is usually limited by a certain depth range, and objects that are closer or farther away than this range appear blurry. This selective sharpness can be used as a way to frame or highlight specific objects of interest and is therefore a very common artistic feature. We can use our path tracer setup to simulate the focal length f and the aperture used with the camera. The way to do this in a path tracer is to first create a ray through the pixel as before, then choose a focal point along that ray at a fixed distance f. Next, we pick an origin on a disk at distance 0, which simulates the lens of the camera. You will need two additional random values or sampling dimensions to accomplish that. The extent of that disk depends on the aperture that you want to simulate in your model. We can then trace the ray from the origin through the focal point of the simulated lens into the scene. This effectively adds a circle of confusion for objects in your renderings depending on their distance from the focal plane. Note that including these additional dimensions in your integration might require you to actually invest a few extra samples to get a smooth image. The second effect that we will look at and that is easy to integrate into a path tracer is motion blur. Again, this is mostly for artistic reasons to recreate the behavior of physical light capturing media. Motion blur occurs when the exposure of the medium is longer than the duration of movements that are being captured. The longer the exposure or the faster something moves, the more motion blur will be present in your scene. In real-time rendering, we can use motion blur to hide smaller artifacts. For offline rendering, it can be used to convey the impression of quickly moving objects in a single image. With motion blur, we just have one extra dimension that we need to add, and that is time. There are two aspects to achieve some basic motion blur in your renderings. 
The first and probably the easier option is to only enable motion of the camera. To do this, you need a motion path with timestamps for the camera position. For each ray, you then pick a random variable that represents time. If we want to render a scene that was recorded over the range of a second, the time t should be in the range from 0 to 1. Depending on the position of your camera at time t, you then create corresponding view rays to shoot into your scene from different origins. The remainder of your implementation can stay exactly the same. The second aspect is to support moving geometry. For this, you will need to define a motion path with timestamps for each object in your scene. To support this, the intersection test with geometry in the scene must be parameterized with a random variable t that indicates the time at which the ray is traced, and all intersection tests should be performed according to the movement of objects over time. This way, rays that are shot in the same directions could be hitting different objects depending on which time t was chosen for the sample. Of course, for full motion blur support, you can also combine the two aspects and support both moving cameras and moving objects in your scene. It's time to end today's tour of the path tracing algorithm. We covered a lot of ground, from direct lighting to a poor first version with indirect light, to better sample distributions and Russian roulette with a cleanup phase to use the BSDF interface and some basic suggestions on how you could make your existing solution more versatile. However, there is still a lot to do here. The renderings we have produced so far are already decent, but by no means impressive. There's a clear obstacle in our way, and its name is performance. The scenes we rendered so far are very simple in all regards. Very little geometry, simple materials, no complex lighting effects. What if we tried to apply our path tracing to something more challenging? Below you see an experiment that arguably didn't turn out so well. We rendered a scene of a moderately complex model with 500,000 triangles and diffuse materials. It took us 17 hours to produce this rather coarse looking image on the right. Clearly we have a performance problem. So is path tracing doomed again? The answer again is a resounding no. By the end of this course, we will be making better looking images with complex materials in a matter of seconds. And the key to get there is to attack that problem at multiple fronts. First of all, we will make sure that we use yet more effective sampling strategies by leveraging important sampling as much as we can. Light source sampling, which we mentioned briefly, will make a comeback and give us a big performance boost in the form of next event estimation. We will also see how we can combine different sampling techniques and actually see how the proverbial whole is much bigger than the sum of its parts. Additionally, we will make sure that bigger scenes can be handled more efficiently by employing adequate spatial acceleration structures and optimized traversal strategies. Last but not least, we will be making our renderings more impressive by introducing several kinds of different materials and adding support for them into our path tracer with different BSDFs. We hope you are looking forward to these steps and you were able to enjoy today's lecture. On this last slide, we have collected the references we used and related work that you might find interesting if you are ready to make some wild extensions to your basic path tracing framework. Maybe you will find the time to try one or two of these improvements before joining us for the next lecture. Until then, we thank you for sticking around until the end and we hope to also see you next time.